<clears throat> I'm glad you took that contaminated microphone. <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, uh, some people, they've just started doing this, but I carry it all the time. So anyway, well, Lord, thank you. I know we prayed, but I always want to acknowledge my dependence on you again. So thank you for being with us. And we, we pray that this will be meaningful the way that you want it to be in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so normally I write commentaries. As you mentioned, I'm a New Testament scholar. So I'm a little bit out of my discipline in, in this way, except that the Bible talks so much about miracles. And so originally I was writing a, a commentary on Acts, and I was just going to have a footnote explaining you know, why it's, it's plausible to accept the miracle accounts in Acts as, you know, historically plausible. <clears throat> but the footnote grew and grew, and it became an 1,100-page book. <laughs> so I, I'm not always good at keeping things under control. But anyway, what, one objection to the gospel's historical reliability comes from modern Western academic thought. Knowingly or unknowingly, most people have voiced this objection and say, well, you know, you can't trust the Gospels as referring to eyewitness material. You, you can't trust Acts as referring to eyewitness material because, look, they include miracles. <clears throat> and I've actually had people voice that objection to me. Well, if it, were, if it were another kind of work, we'd accept it as historical material, but no, you can't. Look, it's full of miracles. <clears throat> so the, the assumption that those things can't be historically reliable, knowingly or unknowingly, follows the argument of David Hume. Many doubt that authentic miracle reports could actually go back uh, either directly or indirectly to eyewitnesses. And therefore, they doubt that the reports in the Gospels reflect early tradition. Well, there's a couple different issues here. Uh, the first one I dealt with more in my first book. I didn't want to digress too much on the second one because it's the more controversial. But the first one was, and, I, and I've been able to persuade, I think, many skeptics, at least of this, because it's so obvious. Can such reports come from eyewitnesses? Well, the unequivocal answer ought to be yes. Today, there are hundreds of millions of such reports from eyewitnesses. So to say that eyewitnesses can't report these things, a person's head has to be in the sand. Uh, not all of these are equally verifiable, but they do come from eyewitnesses. Now, the second question is a question in philosophy of religion that's actually debated in philosophy of religion. Do these reports reflect special divine action? And of course, in philosophy of religion, they debate, is there a God who can engage in special divine or any kind of divine action? No one would say that all these reports actually are special divine action. Nobody would say all of these are actual miracles. Whether we affirm or deny that some or many of them are special divine action depends on and reveals our presuppositions. Miracles and exorcism accounts comprise over half of Mark's narrative before the Passion and roughly one-fifth of the Book of Acts. And they're a common reason for skeptics doubting the historicity of these works. And it's not just Mark. But it's every layer of early Christian tradition. I mean, for people to say, yeah, we only know a little bit about the historical Jesus. Well, this would have to be among those things that we know because it's, it's there in Q, uh, or at least what many of us call Q. It's, it's in Mark. It's in material that's exclusive to Matthew, material that's exclusive to Luke, material that's exclusive to John. Uh, it's, in, it's in Paul. Uh, he doesn't describe it on a regular basis, but when he's describing his, his ministry, uh, groundbreaking evangelism, he talks about signs and wonders happening all over the place. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, it's in Romans 15, 19. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, he says, you yourselves are witnesses of these things. Um, of course, you have it in Acts. You have it in detractors of early Christianity as well. And... Uh, Revelation talks about it. Church fathers talk about continuing miracles in their own times. 
The historical modern Western reason for denying miracles, uh, the, the one that, that gained traction in Western academic thought, was Hume's essay, which essentially denies that any credible eyewitnesses exist for miracles. And in, in my discipline of New Testament, you have some famous deniers like David Friedrich Strauss, who actually improved on the previous rationalistic argument. Uh, the previous rationalistic argument was when Jesus walked on water, he just knew where the stones were in the Lake of Galilee. Uh, Strauss rightly said, that's absurd. But Strauss's solution was to say, these are myths that merely developed over generations of time, myths and legends that, you know, he, had, he, he recognized those couldn't come overnight, but he said, you know, give it enough time, they can evolve. And Rudolf Bultmann was a more recent uh, detractor. David Friedrich Strauss argued that the gospel miracle stories are legends. But interestingly enough, Strauss should have known better from his own experience, which he basically ruled out from his uh, heritage of Humean philosophy. Strauss had a friend by the name of Edward Morica. But Edward Morica had a diagnosed spinal problem that made it very difficult for him to walk. He wasn't even a New Testament scholar, bent over his manuscripts all the time. But anyway, uh, Edward Morica spent time visiting German Lutheran pastor Johann Christoph Blumhardt, who was known for a ministry of healing and exorcism in the Black Forest region of Germany in the mid-1800s. Uh, he actually was called by Bart, one of his mentors, and, and uh, Moltmann looked back to him very respectful, looks back to him very respectfully too. But uh, Blumhardt had this ministry, Strauss, Strauss thought that was absurd, but after his friend Morica had spent time with Blumhardt, Morica was hiking in the mountains. Well, what did Strauss say about this? He said, well, his diagnosed spinal problem must have been merely psychosomatic. But notice what he did not say. He did not say that this report was merely a legend that evolved over generations. Bultmann said that mature modern people don't believe in miracles. It's impossible to use the uh, telegraph and to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. And he dismissed the stories of Blumhardt as legends. So at least he was consistent, right? But today, we have first-hand accounts, letters, uh, journals, and so on, of miracles that took place in Blumhardt's ministry, this material directly from eyewitnesses. So these were not legends. Bultmann says that the modern world denies miracles. It's just a mere fiat, a mere presupposition, excluding from the modern world the majority of humanity, all traditional Jews, Christians, Muslims, traditional tribal religionists, spiritists, you know, I mean, at least he's even-handed dismissing pretty much all of humanity. Uh, but by, by mere assumption, he limits the modern world to Westerners shaped by the radical enlightenment. Now, Houston Gonzalez, citing Latino churches, declares that what Bultmann declares to be impossible is not just possible, but it's even frequent. Hua Yung, retired Methodist Bishop of Malaysia and a seminary professor, says that Bultmann's philosophic problem is an exclusively Western one. And um, a number of other scholars, uh, not, not all associated with the evangelical tradition, but just from these various other cultures who haven't been shaped so much by Western academia, have pushed back against Bultmann. Most deniers ultimately depend on the arguments of David Hume. David Hume himself was rehashing the arguments of radical deists, uh, has been shown very uh, fully in a dissertation by Robert Burns. But basically, David Hume's argument is that there's no genuinely credible eyewitnesses for miracles. And of course, if anybody claims to be a credible eyewitness, well, they're not really credible, because look what they're claiming. So, uh, his essay consists of two major arguments. The second, I believe, depends on the first, but super simplified version of his first argument. Miracles violate natural law, but his prescriptive view of natural law doesn't fit any view of natural law that's held today, and therefore actually shouldn't carry any weight today. And 
he also claims to be depending on Isaac Newton's uh, mechanistic universe. The problem is that Newton didn't believe that the legislator was subject to his own laws. Newton believed, yes, in, in a sort of uniformity in nature, but it was a uniformity that God was free to, to sidestep. I mean, if, if I, I'm not breaking the law of gravity, I'm not violating the law of gravity if I catch something that I, I drop, God is not breaking laws, he's not violating laws. If he functions as an actor within the universe, uh, he may be outside the universe, but for him to not be able to act within the universe makes him weaker within the universe than we are. His, his second argument, uh, so uh, yeah, just to say that it wasn't a scientific argument that he was making. He actually didn't agree with the early English scientists on this. It was a philosophic argument, and it didn't even follow his own normal epistemology. The, the uh, second argument is that uniform human experience excludes the plausibility of miracles. Therefore, well-supported eyewitness claims for miracles must be rejected because we don't have any reason to believe that miracles happen. That's a circular argument, if there ever was one. So, for example, he cites something from fairly recent history. Uh, I mean, he's ready to dismiss arguments from any non-white cultures uh, and non-Western cultures. He was very ethnocentric. Uh, he actually supported slavery and all sorts of other stuff, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. But he, he even rejected accounts from within, you know, close to his own culture. So how many of you had heard of Hume before, before now? That's, that's good. Um, and you may think I'm picking on him because he's dead, making this a posthumous critique. <laughs> that was a slight bit of Hume or, but anyway. Uh, how many of you have heard of Blaise Pascal? Yeah, if you, if you hadn't heard of Blaise Pascal, he's sometimes considered the father of the modern computer. How many of you have heard of computers? <laughs> so Bla Blaise Pascal had a wonderful experience with the Holy Spirit, but his, his niece, uh, I think Bernadette Perrier, was that it? His, his niece had a, a running eyesore that emitted a foul odor. Um, it was public knowledge, and she was touched with a holy thorn from Jesus' crown. Now, how many of you think it was really a holy thorn from Jesus' crown? Neither, neither do I. I think Luther was probably right when he said there were enough nails from the Holy Cross to shoe every horse in Saxony, and, and when he protested why 13 of the original 12 apostles were buried in Germany. But anyway, um, Pascal's niece was touched with this. It was a contact point for her faith, she was instantly and publicly healed. The Queen Mother of France sent her own physician and verified this, so it was medically documented. Pascal says, look, this has all the criteria that I ask for. It's medically documented. It was public. It was organic. And he says, we don't believe this, so why would we believe anything else? And then he goes on. That's his argument. Is there a problem with that argument? And he hasn't demonstrated anything, but he got away with it because of the polemical character of Catholics versus Protestants in his era. You know, Protestants didn't like Catholic miracles. And, and this was associated with the Jansenist movement, who were too Augustinian for the Jesuits, and they were too Catholic for the Protestants, and so he could get away with dismissing it. There have been a number of recent major philosophic challenges to Hume on miracles published by Cambridge, Cornell. Uh, the one published by Oxford is called Hume's Abject Failure, his essay on miracles. And uh, someone responded to this in a review and says, you just, don't like, you just don't like his argument because you're a Christian. To which he responded, actually, I'm not a Christian in any traditional sense. I just thought it was a bad argument. Science is science pronounces on repeatable events. It doesn't pronounce on unique events in history, such as miracles by definition are. Journal articles usually treat only what's replicable. Miracles aren't, again, by definition. Skeptics demand replicability, and so this gives a problem because they're demanding something that almost by definition can't be provided. 
and hard skeptics demand something that can never happen naturally, uh, something that can never happen naturally, but often God works through nature. I mean, think of the parting of the sea. Sometimes we think of that as a, as a prototypical miracle, the parting of the Yom Suf. But Exodus 14 says God sent a strong east wind and blew it back. Now, normally a strong east wind wouldn't do that, but you can't say, well, he didn't work through natural causes because the Bible says he did. <laughs> so, I mean, Hume's, the way Hume has it set up and the way some skeptics have it set up, there's no evidence that they're willing to accept, virtually no evidence that they're willing to accept. But for each subject, we use the appropriate method. Much science involves experimentation, but not all of our knowledge can come through experimentation. For example, if somebody dies and you want to see how they died, you don't kill them again to ascertain that. That would, be, that would definitely be malpractice. Events in history, including miracles, are not subject to experiments. We can say, well, they, they fit a certain kind of activity. That's true, but that only rules out miracles if you say that miracles don't happen, because otherwise they can fit in, in that category. Eyewitness testimony is a form of evidence in sociology, anthropology, law, journalism, and of course, historiography. <clears throat> and in some of these cases, we also have medical records, especially in, in some of the Western cases. And this semester, I've been working on collecting more of the medical records. But history works by analogy. So sometimes skeptics say, well, it has to be the same kind of events as recorded elsewhere. And they say miracles are unique in kind. Well, not if we have other examples of miracles. So unless you a priori rule out miracles, we do have other cases and we have good evidence for them. But one principle that I'm following with regard to eyewitnesses is that a smaller number of eyewitnesses should count more heavily than a greater number of skeptical non-witnesses. What, what I'm saying is uh, this is something we would apply to claims in general. If there's a traffic accident and the officer is interviewing witnesses and somebody comes up and contradicts those other witnesses and says, that's not what happened. I know that's not what happened. And the officer says, <clears throat> well, can you tell me what you saw happen? Well, I didn't see anything happen. I wasn't there. That's why I know it didn't happen. We normally wouldn't take that very seriously, right? But sometimes with miracles, people do that. Well, I didn't see it. We need to be willing to accept eyewitness evidence on some of these things. Um, Hume's and Boltmann's samples are pretty monocultural, and they limit experience to a very narrow range. Hume declared that only ignorant and barbarous nations, this is a, he's taking this almost directly from earlier deists, only ignorant and barbarous nations affirm miracles. Now, if somebody said this today, we would rightly call them an ethnocentric bigot, which Hume was. <clears throat> His anti-Semitism is well known. He said all great inventions in art and so on came from white civilizations, you know, totally ignorant of Chinese civilizations, Indian civilizations, um, African civilizations, and so on. He supported slavery. The abolitionists had to argue against him. Uh, people pointed out to him that there was a Jamaican who could repeat poetry and recite poetry and compose poetry, both in English and in Latin. Uh, this, this was uh, Francis Williams, of whom they were speaking. And he, he said, ah, any parrot can repeat what it hears. He was a bigot. So he's, you know, he's dismissing a lot of the world's credibility. Are there some credible eyewitnesses for miracles today? Yes, and all around the world. If we start with churches known for that emphasis, global Pentecostal and charismatic healing, there was a study on that published by Oxford uh, a number of studies are being published on this now. There was a 2006 Pew Forum survey of Pentecostals and Charismatics in just 10 countries. And in these 10 countries alone, you, you total up the, the stats for these, somewhere around 200 million Pentecostals and Charismatics in these 10 countries alone claim to have witnessed or experienced divine healing. What's more surprising is, because as a control group, they were, they were uh, figuring out other Christians 
who weren't Pentecostal or charismatic. So if you don't like Pentecostals or charismatics, it shouldn't affect the argument. Around 39% of other Christians who didn't claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic also claimed to have witnessed divine healings. So, you know, this is just 10 countries. But we're talking about, globally, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people who claim to have witnessed this. And even in the US, around one third of, of Americans claim to have witnessed or experienced divine or supernatural healing. And that includes not just Christians, it includes Hindus and, and others. Now the point is not what proportion of these claims involve genuinely divine activity or miracles. Wh whether for theological reasons or logistical reasons or philosophical, wh whatever our reasons, nobody would say that all of these were divine action. But the point is, when you have hundreds of millions of people claiming to have witnessed special divine action, Hume's starting premise can't work as a starting premise, that eyewitnesses don't claim these things, and no credible eyewitnesses claim these things. I, Hume was a smart guy. If he were around today, I don't think this would be the basis of his argument. And yet it's the basis of the argument that is usually assumed as having proved that miracles don't happen. So we need to explore claims rather than dismiss them. Another point is that it's not just Christians who claim to have witnessed Christian miracles. Millions of non-Christians have been convinced through these things. So it's not just a Christian bias or an apologetic to make Christianity look good. There are people who have changed centuries of their cultural allegiances, their ancestral beliefs about religion because of extraordinary healings. Some have suggested, uh, J.P. Moreland suggested, based on other statistics, that 70% that of global evangelical growth in the last few decades has been due to signs and wonders. Conversions in China, uh, China was not in the survey of the 10 nations above, but one source from within the China Christian Council suggested <clears throat> around the year 2000 that roughly half of all conversions to Christianity in the previous 20 years have been due to what they termed faith healing experiences. Within the house church movement, the statistics were even higher. Um, and again, there's no way to verify exactly what level this, uh, what percentage it is, but one estimate there was closer to 90%. Now these were people not starting with Christian premises, but who became Christians because of what they witnessed or experienced. Dr. Bal Krishna Sharma in Nepal shared with me that 80% of converts in Nepal do, are due to healings and exorcisms. And he has firsthand experience with it. His, his own wife was healed of a brain tumor. <clears throat> now, this stat surprises me. I don't know how they got it or who they interviewed, but 10% uh, of non-Christians in Chennai had experienced uh, this, was, this was in 1981 in Madras. 10% of non-Christians who were interviewed claimed that they had been healed when somebody prayed for them in the name of Jesus. Um, some people got converted. Some people were still holding on to their ancestral tradition. Pastor Israel, one of my, not that all ancestral tradition is wrong, but I mean regarding G, uh, Jesus and monotheism. Pastor Israel was one of my past seminarians from India. Through prayer for the sick, his Baptist church grew from a handful to about 600, all from Hindu or Muslim backgrounds. Now, I found out about this because uh, in, the, in the very room where this picture was taken, I came in one, one time with a splitting headache, and he said, oh brother, let me pray for you. And he prayed for me, and nothing happened. Although it has gone away since then. <clears throat> I, I, I said, um, Ah, it's because I don't have any faith. He said, no, no, brother, it, it, it doesn't work here. <laughs> Everybody I pray for in India gets healed because, because God just wants to lavish his, his, his love on these people who, who have no access to the gospel. So it's not, I'm not saying he doesn't love us here, but you know, God's blessed us in, in various other ways. 
Uh, now, some of you may have heard of Sai Ankem. Sai, am I saying your name right? <laughs> uh, who's a student here at TEDS. His family became Christians when his father, who was dying, was healed when they prayed to Jesus. Um, some of you may know uh, Ebi, uh, Ebenezer Perrin Barash, who is a PhD student here. He, he, uh, he worked with Bari Malto. Is, is Ebi or Esther here? I I saw Esther, no? Okay. Um, uh, he's now a, a PhD student here. He worked with Bari Malto. Now, everybody locally knew the story. Bari Malto had been a shaman, but he contracted leprosy. He was cast out of his village. Well, a couple Christians came and prayed for, for him, and he uh, had a dream that night where an angel came and touched his hands. He woke up in the morning completely healed, went into the village. The entire village was converted. By the time that Ebi got there to work with this movement, half the region had already been converted, and various other miracles had taken place. It was God reaching out to them in a special way. In missiology, we call it a people movement um, as a result of a miracle. In terms of, of lepers being healed, oh yeah, th this, that was the, uh, one of the cases of that. This isn't a new thing. Many church fathers claim to be eyewitnesses of, of healings and exorcisms that were converting many polytheists. In fact, Irenaeus talks about a church in France. He says, you know, you Gnostics, you don't have signs and wonders. Look, we got this church in France where people get raised from the dead often. It, it, Ramsey McMullen, the Yale historian, who was otherwise, you know, he, he, he wasn't happy with what he found, but he, he said that this was the leading cause of conversion in the 300s, uh, healing and exorcism. And I'm, I know I'm skipping over a lot of history, but it's for the sake of time. It was also a prominent feature of the Korean revival. Many of the Western missionaries in Korea in the early 20th century did not believe that miracles happen today, and they believed that demons were merely psychological problems. Not in one caveat here, I do believe that there are psychological problems that are not demons, so I'm not saying that, but, um, but they didn't believe in demons. <clears throat> and they were they were converted to believing these things are real because of what happened in the Korean revival. Now, another caveat, I'm not limiting divine action to dramatic miracles. Healing doesn't have to be dramatic to be an answer to prayer. From a theistic perspective, natural or medical healing, these are also God's acts, they're God's gifts. Uh, you can't get much more miraculous, I think, than the information content in DNA, but everybody takes that for granted uh, if they know about it. So not everybody, but a lot of people do. So my focus here is on uh, what we call extraordinary or special divine action, which is what Christians usually mean by miracles. Where you draw the line between those depends pretty much, that's kind of subjective. But dramatic miracles today most often appear in the same kind of settings in which they appear in the Bible groundbreaking evangelism in relatively new areas. God can answer prayer anywhere, but special signs most often are reported during evangelism in largely unevangelized regions. Not exclusively, as you'll see, but often. <clears throat> we have millions of possible examples. <clears throat> I haven't interviewed millions, but I've interviewed hundreds, and so I'm gonna give, give some examples. And as you see, many of these are significant examples. I'm not claiming that everyone we pray for gets healed. Um, you can tell by looking at me, I wear glasses, I have male pattern balding, and my students often say there's something else wrong with my head. <clears throat> the point of miracles is not as a panacea for the world's problems. In a Christian understanding, miracles are just samples, reminders of the future promise of a world made new. They point us to what God cares about most, that is, about people, for us to care about and love one another. When we work through science and medicine to improve health care for people, this is work that God cares about. But having made those caveats, I'm going on now to give some examples. Barbara Comiskey Snyder, doctor sent her home to die. She had advanced multiple sclerosis, a very severe form of it, for 15 years, uh, at this point, she couldn't breathe without 
being hooked up to the machine that was making her diaphragm work. Um, she tells me that she was blind. She was curled up like a pretzel. When a voice called to her and said, rise up and walk, she jumped out of the bed, which she couldn't have done because her muscles didn't work, but she did it. She, she jumped out of the bed, and the first thing that she noticed was she saw her feet flat on the ground. Second thing she noticed was her hands weren't curled up anymore. And the third thing she noticed was she was seeing all these things. Now, normally, if somebody gets healed of inability to walk, their muscles are still going to be atrophied. It's going to take them time before they can walk normally. But in her case, even that was healed. And she began running around and dancing around the living room with her dad. This was not something that was just inspired by adrenaline. This was 1981. There's been no recurrence of this. And I consulted, uh, I consulted her doctors, uh, who were her doctors at the time, and they verified, yes, this, this was a miracle. <clears throat> um, the case of Lisa Larios, she had reticulum cell sarcoma of the right pelvic bone. She had uh, hip cancer, but it, it had metastasized by the time they found it. So it was already spreading to the rest of her body. The doctor said she was dying, but the, the mother hadn't told Lisa yet. They, but uh, under a neighbor's urging, they took her to a healing meeting. Now, whatever you think of healing meetings, it really doesn't matter too much in this case. Nobody actually laid hands on her. But in this context where people were praying for healing, in this context of faith, Suddenly, Lisa jumped out of her wheelchair. Her mother was panicked. You can't do that. Started running around the room. Again, no, no momentary burst of adrenaline because Lisa uh, shocked her father when she came back home pushing her wheelchair. The x-rays afterwards showed that not only did she no longer have the cancer, but where her bones had been eaten away by the cancer, her bones had been healed. That's not something that can happen naturally. By the way, I mentioned we have medical documentation for some. These, these are among them. Uh, Greg Spencer had, had gone uh, legally blind for macular degeneration, which doesn't naturally undegenerate. He was legally blind. He was 2,400 in one eye and 2,200 in the other. He was at a retreat for the healing of, of his mind. He wasn't praying for the healing of his eyesight. He was praying for the healing of his mind from stuff he'd, he'd witnessed before he was a Christian when he worked uh, as, a, as a police officer. And suddenly, he could see. God, God gave him an extra benefit. He healed his mind. He also healed his eyesight. And Greg, uh, the people who were there with him at that conference testify about how he he was going around you know, reading license plates and showing all the stuff he could do. He was so excited. Um, and in this case, we have the medical documentation. Most people don't bother to get medical documentation or think about getting it. I didn't in times when I was healed. Um, actually, I, I was a poor graduate student. I couldn't afford to go to a doctor. But anyway, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, take care of you later. So, uh, Greg, Greg Spencer was legally blind, uh, and he had to get the medical documentation because he tried to get off disability, and the Social Security Administration said macular degeneration doesn't go away. So if you don't have it now, you, you're guilty of fraud. So they investigated him for a year, and finally at the end of the year, they sent him a notice saying, you know, you, you've had a remarkable return of your visual acuity, and therefore you're no longer qualified for disability. Well, downside to everything, you have to go back to work. <laughs> uh, my brother Chris and I, uh, he later did a PhD in physics, so, you know, Hume says no educated person claims this stuff, so I'm just telling you, some of us are educated. But anyway, my brother Chris, uh, and I were helping at a nursing home Bible study uh, a couple years after my conversion, and uh, he came to Christ shortly after me. So uh, I, I was converted from atheism. Um, we, were, we were at a nursing home Bible study, 
And there was a, a lady there named Barbara who always came in a wheelchair, always said, I wish I could walk, I wish I could walk. And one day, the Bible study leader said, I'm tired of this. He, he was a Fuller Seminarian studying under George Ladd, you know, and George Ladd was talking about miracles, the signs of the kingdom, and so on. So my, uh, the Bible study leader walked over to her, grabbed her by the hand, said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk and lifted her by the hand. Now, if faith is a bias, I cannot be accused of it in this case, because I was sure she was going to fall on the ground. And it wasn't her faith either, because I could tell by looking at her, she was, she was utterly horrified. So if this was psychosomatic, it wasn't her psycho. He walked her around the room, and she's, she was as stunned as everybody else. But from then on, Barbara could walk. And she would come every week to the Bible study and say, I love my Bible study. I love my Bible study. <laughs> a friend of mine, Flint McLaughlin, director of Transforming Business Institute at Cambridge University. 2004, he prayed, and there were other people with him, and I was able to consult them. Prayed for a blind man in northern India with clouded eyes, which I assume had to do with cataracts. But I, I'm not sure. Um, and this is where the man ran in circles, praising God for his eyesight. And uh, here is where he was testifying that night about his restored eyesight. And he began to weep. And they said, why are you weeping? He said, because I'd always heard the sound of children, but I'd never seen their faces. <clears throat> Dr. Rex Gardner uh, published an article back in the 1980s in the British Medical Journal, giving examples of healings. Uh, and also he has a, a book called Healing Miracles. And I'm going to give just one example from this book. But there was a, a nine-year-old girl. She was deaf without her hearing aid, but she was praying for healing. She was instantly healed. They called the audiologist. Well, she'd just been tested like the day before. They called the audiologist and said, that's not possible. This is auditory nerve damage. It's not just going to go away just like that. But... I, I guess insurance regulations were different back then. Uh, he got her in, tested her again the next day, and he said, I have no explanation for this, but she can hear perfectly. Some people say, ah, well, limbs never grow back. Oh, well, not very often, but you know, once in a while you've got things growing back. Bruce Van Natta was crushed under a semi-truck that he was working under, crushed his abdomen, <laughs> Doctors did what they could, but basically his small intestine, most of it was gone. Most of it had to be removed. It was, it was no good. Um, after several surgeries, I mean, there was one part of his, his uh, ilium. He just had 25 centimeters left. It's normally 350 centimeters. So as a consequence, he was, he was starving. Um, his, his body couldn't process food. A friend of his felt led to to actually fly there in person from New York to Wisconsin and pray for him. And he commanded the small intestine to grow in the name of Jesus. Bruce felt something like an electric jolt. The radiologist testifies now that the small intestine was now long enough to be functional. He estimated it grew about 2.4 times over. Uh, now, the small intestine in an adult can widen but it can't naturally grow longer. So here we have a case of something growing back, medically attested. <clears throat> Eyewitnesses, some of whom I know, report the healings of deaf non-Christians in Jesus' name in Mozambique. And I actually know the couple here. Um, uh, both, and again, these are both educated people. Uh, Rollins has a, a Doctor of Ministry degree from United Theological Seminary, and Heidi has a PhD and theology from King's College in London. Uh, it's led to massive church growth. They'll go into a village, they'll, they'll uh, often show the Jesus film, they'll uh, pray for the sick. Sometimes they don't even get to start praying. Uh, I, I talked with somebody who, who was doing this preaching in one of these Muslim villages in Mozambique, and people started getting healed of blindness and deafness while she, while she was preaching about Jesus. And so she said, okay, now we'll start praying for the sick. But, but it was something God was doing extraordinary to, to bring the gospel to these people. 
so that entire villages that were once classified as Muslim are now classified as Christian because of this groundbreaking evangelism that's going on. Well, a medical team went there to explore this. Uh, and in September of 2010, they published the results in the Southern Medical Journal of a number of people who went from technically blindness to seeing and deafness to hearing immediately after prayer. Now, skeptics on the internet um, raise the, the legitimate critique that testing conditions in rural Mozambique are not ideal. But one of the authors of the study, Dr. Candy Gunther Brown, answers those critics. She's a professor at um, Indiana University. She answers those critics in a book published by Harvard University Press in 2012. In, in one of her chapters in this book, she talks about that study. And if you can read that chapter and not believe people went from blindness to seeing and from deafness to hearing, you really do not have an open mind to the possibility of miracles because it's, it's pretty clear. Um, and I, I've talked with other eyewitnesses there. I was invited to go there, but I haven't been able to make it there yet. But uh, Brandon Walker has a PhD in New Testament from the University of Nottingham, was there, testifies of miracles he saw. Uh, Wendy Dykeman and Anderson Park, who are professors at United Theological Seminary, uh, also testify of what they saw. Uh, Wendy, Wendy reported witnessing blindness healed in one of these villages in Mozambique, and the next day a church was started there. Well, are healings ever caught on video? Uh, I gave a lecture on this at Wheaton some years ago, and a science professor says, how come these are never caught on video? Well, now we have lots of videos of them. Some of them, I think, are faked. But this one is definitely not faked. Um, Delia Knox, uh, I think I'm saying her name wrong. Delia Knox, uh, originally from Buffalo, New York. I ran into so many people from Buffalo and Rochester from that area who were telling me about you know, how she, she definitely couldn't walk for 22 years. She was injured in an automobile accident and uh, paralyzed from the waist down. No feeling from the waist down. And it was public knowledge. You can, you can go online, find all these old pictures of her and old videos of her. She was a gospel singer, so there's lots of videos of her when she was in that state. And I've met lots of people who knew her in that state. Um, she didn't like going to meetings where people prayed for the sick because she had been jerked out of her chair. Nothing happened. You know, made to feel like she didn't have any faith, stuff like that. You may have heard of things like that happening. Uh, if, if God isn't in it, we don't really need that. <laughs> but um, somebody had, had, had shared with her, someday when you're praying for somebody else, you're going to be healed. Well, after 22 years, she was getting kind of discouraged, like, OK, I, I'm just going to live with this. But one day, as she was in a, a revival meeting, and she prayed for a child. She had this great compassion as she was praying for this child. Suddenly, she had feeling in her legs. And she, and she rolled herself up to the front and said, pray for me now. And they prayed for her. And she began to, uh, they helped her up. And she began to walk. Now, it didn't look like walking to a lot of people. But because, you know, there were people who had to hold her up. Uh, you know, her muscles had been atrophied. But she was, she was actually able to move her hips. She was able to walk like that. Now, when she got home, she couldn't walk. So was it just temporary? Well, her muscles were atrophied. She began exercising those muscles. And a few weeks later, we have another video of her online walking normally. Uh, her feet still hurt some because they weren't used to touching the, the pavement. But she was completely healed. And what was the best? Criti I mean, the crit criticisms on the internet for the first video were, ah, you call that walking. Uh, and then, then the, you know, if, if, if she had been walking like this initially, they would have said, ah, must be fake. Her muscles should be atrophied. But a few weeks later, when she is walking normally, what was the best criticism? She faked paralysis for 22 years just so she could claim a miracle. When that's the best that a hard skeptic can come up with, I would say they're on really thin ice. 
Uh, well, some say, well, you've never seen anybody raised from the dead. I'm glad you raised that question. Why examine this category of healings? Well, some, some things people say are psychosomatic, but people aren't usually psychosomatically dead. Uh, irreparable brain damage normally begins after just six minutes with no oxygen. So, uh, uh, Wainaina, I think, is here, right? Yeah. Uh, Wainaina shared with me about his own son who was dead for 10 minutes after birth, and they, they prayed. He has no brain damage. He's, he's fully, fully functional, fully healthy. You can meet him around the campus. Um, and it's not just a, a one-off. Um, some people, you know, sometimes people are misdiagnosed as dead. Um, as far as anybody can tell, they're dead, but maybe we were wrong. But if it's a coincidence, we have an incredible cluster of coincidences in that, I mean, most people who are dead stay dead, but we have an incredible cluster of coincidences. In my own circle, I know 10 people. Uh, this is in, not including my nina, but these were people I knew before hearing their testimonies who have witnessed people raised from the dead or have been among them. It's multiply attested in early sources about Jesus. We also have it in uh, Quadratus, writing in the early second century, says that uh, some that Jesus raised from the dead lived into his own time, uh, presumably late first century. We have subsequent raisings, including uh, a Mesopotamian bishop was converted in the year 99 through witnessing a raising. Augustine includes that in, in his City of God 22.8 among uh, healings that were still taking place in his own time that they had documentation for. Again, I'm skipping a lot of history, but uh, John Wesley in his journal reports it on the day that it happened. Mr. Myrick uh, came back. So it's eyewitness from the very day. Found scores of modern testimonies, but I'm running low on time. So I'm gonna hurry through just a few of these. Dr. Chauncey Crandall, a cardiologist, West Palm Beach. Uh, Jeff Markin was dead, uh, flatlined for about 40 minutes. Uh, Dr. Crandall had signed the death certificate, went back to make his rounds, felt led to come back and pray for the man to have a second chance to know the Lord. Um, now, this guy was not just dead, he was very obviously dead. Dr. Crandall tells me he had cyanosis, his, his uh, Fingers had started turning black. That guy was white. His fingers had started turning black. Uh, but he prayed for him. The guy came back to life. No brain damage. He did have a second chance to know the Lord. Here is Dr. Crandall participating in his baptism. Dr. Sean George, dead for, uh, for about an hour and a half, medically, clinically dead. That, that time, they shocked him so many times. He has all the records because he's a doctor. He knew how to get those records. And... The, uh, his, his fellow doctors, many of whom were, were Muslims and Hindus, agreed that this was a miracle. Uh, I mean, they, they'd done everything they could possibly do. His wife, who was also a doctor, came in and prayed. His heart started immediately. He has no brain damage. Uh, Indonesia, uh, from, uh, okay, I have this picture from my neighbor who introduced me to the guy so that I could show you the next picture so I could remember to tell you to close your eyes if you get queasy at the sight of blood. But um, somebody had their neck clearly cut. Uh, this is after the body's been moved. There was a lot more blood at the original site. Looks pretty dead to me. The people transporting him to the hospital thought he was pretty dead. He did need his neck sewn back. But in any case, he had um, an experience of heaven, was sent back into his body, and the, you know, the doctors were getting ready to send him to the morgue, and he squeaked out, and I don't know how he did this, given the condition of his neck, I'm alive. And so they, they were shocked, but they sewed him back, and he goes around, you know, Jacob still had his limp, and this guy uh, still has his neck scars. Uh, some African samples, uh, I'm gonna skip a lot of these, but um, th this was, uh, I presented some of this at an SBL, meeting, praying with great trepidation, but 
uh, presented some of this in the SBL meeting, maybe we could look at these narratives a little bit differently. It's, if instead of looking at it through a Western Humean lens, we, we heard it the way that some, some people in the majority world heard it. And so, uh, I presented some case studies, and at the end, Dr. Ayo Arawuya uh, stood up and said, yeah, actually, my, my child was born dead, um, and we prayed for half an hour and came back to life, no brain damage, He's now got a Master of Science degree. Uh, he also has an MBA. Uh, we have a number of examples from my wife's country, Congo Brazzaville. This one's from the head of the denomination there at that time. Uh, we have examples from uh, uh, Mama Jean Mabiala. She, she had three accounts, uh, which we were also able to verify with other witnesses, including my brother-in-law. Um, uh, Papa Albert Besuesue, I'd love to tell you more about this one, but for the sake of time, I, I won't. But this was somebody who was dead for about eight hours, and they brought the child. He prayed. The child came back to life. They were so impressed in the village that the next time a child died, they came looking for him. But he was, he was a school inspector. He was in another village at that point. So they got his wife, and she prayed, and that child came back to life. But this is the one that was a turning point for my own skepticism. Uh, even though it's not the most dramatic. Antoinette Malambe recounted that her, uh, her two-year-old daughter cried out that she was bitten by a snake. Antoinette got to her. The child was not breathing. There was no medical help available in the village. She strapped the child to her back, ran to a nearby village where family friend Coco Ngoma Moise was doing ministry. Coco Moise prayed for the child. The child started breathing again. The next day, she was fine. Um, the child had no brain damage. She now has uh, a master's degree from a seminary, seminary in Cameroon. She's doing ministry back in, in Congo. Um, now, this got my attention in particular. Um, it wasn't so much the length of time. I asked her, how long was she not breathing? And she had to stop and think to get from one village to the other. She said, about three hours. Well, you know, six minutes with no oxygen, irreparable brain damage has started in. But, you know, I had a lot of accounts that were more than three hours. This one got my attention, though, because uh, Antoinette Malambe is my, uh, or was my, my mother-in-law, and Therese is my sister-in-law, uh, and the lovely, lovely, lovely one there that I'm looking forward to seeing, hopefully if they don't cancel my flight, is my wife. Um, that was a turning point because it really got my attention, and we have other accounts from Congo and elsewhere. Uh, and by the way, we did, uh, not to doubt one's mother-in-law, but we did confirm it with Coco Moise, the other witness. Unless we're burying too many people prematurely, how often would you say we misdiagnose death? One case in 10? Probably not. <laughs> one case in 1,000, one case in 10,000? What are the odds of any given person knowing somebody who witnessed a raising based on such a coincidence? What are the odds of knowing 10 people. I mean, if, if the odds are like one chance in 10 that you would know somebody who was misdiagnosed as dead and just happened to come back to life when somebody prayed for them, the odds of knowing 10 people that way, I think would be somewhere around like one in 10 billion. So, but, but it's, like, it's the way people do with, you know, talking about the multiverse instead of saying, uh, more simply, Occam's razor, there's just one God outside the universe who, who did it. People will often resort to the most improbable scenarios. I mean, we, we have the problem of evil to deal with, but they have the problem of, of divine action. And if your response to divine action, you're, you have to resort to improbabilities, like one chance in 10 billion, one chance in 10 trillion, whatever, uh, you have to admit that your view is rather improbable. Uh, time, time would fail me to, to give all the millions of things. Let me just mention nature miracles. Uh, Sai Krishna could, could give you one here. Uh, Kevin Burr, one of my doctoral students, uh, talks about a, a storm that stopped when he prayed. Watchman Nee had a story about this. Emmanuel Atopson, Maybe this is the one I'll tell, actually, if I, if I go real fast. Uh, he, he, he grew up 
His father was planting churches in northern Nigeria. And uh, it was rainy season. And they just moved to this one village. They needed to get a roof on their hut. And the neighbors were laughing at them, mocking them, saying, everything you have is going to be ruined. Look, it's rainy season. The rains are coming. And the father said, it's not going to rain one drop of rain in this village until I have a roof on my house. And they, and they left laughing. And he said, oh, God, what have I done? And he fell on his face before God. For the next four days, <clears throat> it rained all around the village. But not a single drop of rain fell in the village. And in that, in that village that knew what rainy season was supposed to look like, by the end of the, those four days, there was only one person who had not become a Christian. That, that we, they, they still, to this day, speak of that as the precipitating event that brought about their conversion. Um, and then I also witnessed this praying, praying. I was doing campus ministry, praying with some students. We were about to have an outreach. It was supposed to be pouring down rain all day long. And he said, oh, wow, I had hair back then. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, pour, pouring down rain all day long. And uh, a sophomore said, well, let's, let's pray for the rain to stop. Like, okay. So we, we joined hands and prayed. No sooner had she said amen than it was like my, my faucet that would just drip after, after I turned it off. And, and within, within seconds, it cleared. Within a few minutes, the sun was out, and it didn't rain the rest of the day. And I could go on to talk about power encounters, but uh, I need to turn it over to questions now. And I, I told you I'd get back to you. So, yes, Tom. Um, 